That's what happens. Towns die very fast as a result. Unemployment goes up. We can't allow that to happen. So we must fight back as citizens and we must... Do you regard the ETHOL abolishment as, your, as a pinnacle of your career so far? Big challenge that this country is facing, which is water quality and water scarcity. It's, it's going to make the electricity issue uh, look like child's play if we don't sort it out. Do you believe that you as Wayne are currently in the right place? You know, uh, it's an interesting question because... Welcome to the Right Place podcast, where I learn with you how to navigate the world by building connections that matter, relationships that last, and businesses that thrive. My name is Rudolf Reutenbach, and today I have a conversation with Wayne Duvenage. He's the CEO of the organization Undoing Tax Abuse. Wayne, it's nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to be with you, Rudolf. Good. So Wayne, let's jump straight into it. I want to ask, as a, as a precursor, as a start maybe, the elections are done. We're about three or so months past the elections. We're under a government of national unity. Um, what is your view on this? Are you surprised by the elections? Are you surprised by the coalitions or the government of, of national unity? And how do you see this fanning out? Yeah, look, uh, there were some surprises, certainly MK, uh, and, and they're uh, you know, coming into, especially in the KZN space and the political arena. But I think uh, looking back where we were six months ago to where we are now, I, I believe we're in a far better place. Um, we have a, a government of national unity. We would like to have seen more positions given to other political parties because what we've been able to see very quickly in the new government is how new political players and thinkers are able to start undoing inefficiencies and uh, systemic changes that are required, uh, most notably home affairs, public works, and, uh, and, and other areas. And we, for the first time, are seeing uh, invitations from people uh, where doors were always closed in political places of, of authority, uh, now being opened uh, slightly ajar and to say, look, you know, let's engage. And I think this is in line with what the president has said. You know, let's uh, start engaging more meaningfully with civil society. So we're in a better space now, and I think I think we are going to capitalize on those opportunities and start feeding to the right people who want to listen what we know and what we've gathered and the facts and whistleblower information about what is fundamentally wrong in so many departments and where money is being wasted and stolen. So yeah, it's a, it's it's been a good development, and 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 if they can keep this. This car on this road, it's a bumpy road, no doubt. Uh, but if we can keep it on the road and, and keep our sanity and our egos in our pockets as politicians and work for the best interests of the country, uh, a lot is going to happen in these next five years. And, and it bodes well for, for even bigger change in the uh, next elections in 2029. But interesting. And, and from my perspective to hear how positive you are, with these developments is obviously something that, that I think is good for all South Africans. And if, if you are almost opposed to a lot of things that, that government does see the potential in it, then I think we are really on a, on a good path. Um, mm -hmm. I want to go back to, to where this all started for you, especially you, you started out uh, as a, a part of the um, undoing of urban doling and not yeah. necessarily tax reforms. So, so do you regard the ETHOL abolishment as your as a pinnacle of your career so far? Yeah, I think, uh, firstly, it, 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 was, it was definitely the, 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 the change, the catalyst to change of my career. I mean, I came out of the business world. I was enjoying my role uh, there, but, but, but also in leading a, a, an industry body as well at the time and being the CEO of the of a leading uh, player in the fleet and, and tourism travel industry. Uh, it was very quick uh, uh, for us to see and, 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 and for me to gather the, the collective thinking of the industry to say that something on this ETOL matter was fundamentally wrong. And that triggered the research and we could see what was unfolding. And it, after a year of trying to engage with authorities to get them to come to their senses on that decision, which they're refusing to budge, we can see now more so as we went further down the line as to why this was a corrupt deal, 
Uh, there's a lot of money to be made, potentially sh shifted offshore and so forth, that it was a very necessary challenge. And, and I guess I had to make that decision because it became a full-time issue. You either do deal with this and do it uh, properly with the resources and it needs time. And, and, and I guess, you know, having spent five years in my past role at Avis, uh, time is up, you know, for change. Uh, done a lot of interesting things in the company became the first, you know, uh, a carbon neutral company, big sustainability projects, big uh, service excellence programs we ran, uh, sadly, which all of which has now been uh, put by the wayside. But anyway, uh, and, uh, and, um, and it was 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 time for a new opportunity, I think I didn't really had envisaged this as a career change civil activism. But it was something that needed to be done, and I thought it would be temporary. I really thought that the uh, government would uh, come to their senses, and, and, and they didn't. And so it took a long time, longer than we envisaged, but we got there in the end. And I think one thing that it has cemented in the culture of ARTA is that this resilience and tenacity is a big formula. It's a big ingredient for, for, for effective civil intervention. You've got to, you've got to stay the course. You've got to have the professionals on your team. So this is teamwork. It's not just about me. And you've got to build good governance into civil activism that is going to, to be able to you know, fight off government's uh, attrition through lawfare strategy. They try and weigh you down. Uh, they come at you from all angles because you're getting in the way of big money to be made by connected people. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, the long and short of it, a very big success for civil society, for the people of this country. It is the flagship of what ARTA stood for. Uh, but since 2016, it's gone well beyond ETOLs with uh, almost 300 other projects. that we Good. I, As you stop talking, I'm reminded of something that I heard once where you said that government almost <laughs> opposed the rental car market in totality. We had, you obviously had big contracts with government and now you're opposing the ETOLs part. Mm. And, and it was part of your decision almost to get out of Avis for the good of Avis because um, Avis was going to lose out on, on all their current contracts and, and you decided to move on to the outer thing more full time and obviously took a bit of a personal risk in that. Um, do, do you believe that that was vindicated in the end for both ends, for Avis as, as well as Alta? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, um, uh, I saw the mails. I saw the mails directly to the, uh, to the presidency to consider dumping any car rental company that uh, procured through government uh, contracts if they supported the anti-ETOL decision which put a lot of pressure on all those car rental companies and fleet companies that were all for this fight then suddenly capitulated in a very short space of time. <clears throat> they stopped funding us. This is government's bullying tactics to, to lean on business so that civil society is not funded. It's so unfair, but it is a bullying tactic to say, well, if we can't beat them fair and square, uh, uh, then, then let's just undermine them in other ways. And, and, and that's what... That's what they nearly did, and they nearly killed us, I must say. But at the time, yeah, I, <clears throat> I had to make a decision. I couldn't do both full time. I could see the pressure being put on, on Avis. They didn't ask me to leave, by the way, and they didn't put me under pressure. But I could see the powers that be putting pressure on the boards and the higher levels um, and saw those mails and felt, you know, look, you know, get, first of all, my request for business was to stand up, stand up to the bullying, stand their ground. And this is a right project to take on. This is rightful resistance by business against very bad policy. That was uh, all the research showed uh, why it was never going to work anyway. <clears throat> but I guess they feared government, as they still do in many respects. They still fear this bullying tactic of government. So when you have a government that acts in a, as a bully in this way, you, you must know that they have other agendas at play uh, if they can't deal with matters properly, uh, you know, through the courts of law, through proper engagement to civil society. So it's a good lesson and a good win for civil society. And, uh, yeah, uh, but again, sadly, you know, I think business still has a bigger role to play in defending our democracy against the abuse of power. Yeah. It's not... It's not just up to government to lead, but we need to keep them accountable. And yeah. uh, 
by just giving your vote is not sufficient enough to say that I've taken part and now it's up to them to continue that work. To, to follow on maybe um, from the ETOLs, you, you started out and it was the Urban Tolling Alliance and then yeah. it changed names almost to the undoing of tax abuse. Did, did that lead into the 300 odd projects that you've spoken about, the, a differing mandate? Um, obviously, more or less the same activism, the same drive, but just to open up the channels that you do work in even more. If, if we if we just stayed focused on the ETOL issue, we would have closed down by now. We would have uh, you know moved on. But at the time, around about 2015, 2016, as we were getting the funding model right and citizens started supporting us through a through a crowdfunded model, we were also being asked, why just ETOLs? You know, what are you doing about uh, at that stage state capture hadn't been coined the uh, the, the the public protector Tuli Malancela was putting together her final report of state of capture <clears throat> um but in Candler was headline news uh Nieni, Essa, uh, just you know things were going south and and and, and very clear to us uh, and the public was this abuse of power by by Jacob Zuma and his cabal and uh, we had a strategic think tank session and said, okay, if this is, if this is the launch pad of an entity that's going to be a, a, a mean more to civil society and do what we think it could do, what is that? And that strategic uh, <clears throat> review led to the changing of our memorandum of incorporation. The outer brand was already strong. Uh, as you know, it was uh, opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance. We had to decide, do we rename ourselves or do we keep the outer brand and change the acronym? And that's how we came up with organization undoing tax abuse. And it is the abuse of taxpayers' money by, by the public is really the mandate. And what are we going to do about it? And what we then decided to do was, look, <clears throat> we'd learned that all we were doing in the past process was making law firms rich because, you know, you relied on them. Secondly, uh, litigation is the one avenue of, of, of effective civil intervention, but civil society generally is broke to do that. So we wanted to build an entity that could, could challenge matters quickly in court if need be, interdicts and so forth. And so we put a whole model together, a, a, a strategic model that said, look, if we're going to do this, we are not just going to expose because that's where a lot of civil intervention stops. It just exposes the issue. So what we wanted to do was take the issue, uh, start uh, um, gathering the facts, and then looking at a multi-pronged approach to to holding government to account and to drive the narrative and to raise the issues in the right spaces through parliament, through, through various uh, other oversight entities, uh, and keep the heat on, get that fire raging in the kitchen of the perpetrators uh, so that they have to either change their ways or face the, uh, the rule of law. And, and so we built this methodology of proper investigations, get the facts, engage the powers, expose the powers, start mobilizing society and other oversight entities, mobilize the public through public awareness, and then last uh, but not least, take legal action if need be. It's been a journey of evolution. It's been a journey of new people coming in uh, and growing this team, then revising the strategy, changing it. We no, there's no textbook here, uh, Rudolf. Uh, it's not like you know building a business, running a restaurant or a hotel or something. This is a, s all civil action organisations uh, decide on their mandates, get their governance right, and we wanted to make sure we had all of that in place. And it was like building this car as we were travelling down the highway, because the projects were coming at us thick and thin and then making sure that we try to prioritize what we do. So it's not an exact science, uh, but we've come a long way. We've learned a lot. And I must say, this team of 45 people and growing is an amazing team of specialists, of professionals, of communication specialists, investigators, legal people uh, that, um, <clears throat> you know, when it's like this orchestra and when you put it all together, it just makes magic and, and that's where we are and, and, and we just need to do more, but we, but we don't have all the resources we need. Sounds very, very exciting and also daunting at the same time. As I'm listening to you, um, Wayne, I'm thinking of you obviously in the government's faces, you, you probably irritating them and 
I'm pretty much sure they, they almost want to tell you that they hate you, but you, you're in the call phase, you, you, you're right there. And I'm sure half of them would want to find some dirt on uh, out there and try and put the message the other way around, make it look like you guys are either they unnecessarily or doing the wrong things. How have you, how have you kept out this image as clean as it is? How, how did you get that right? Because just from my own perspective, sometimes when, when you internal, you've got a bit of politics, suddenly someone would go outside and there's this whole smear campaign or, or media attention in unwanted places. But I haven't seen that of out there. How, how have you done that, established it? Is it a buy-in of the people? Is it, is it that everyone there just believes in what you guys do? Um, yeah, how did you do that? Well, firstly, I mean, if you've got baggage, uh, they will find it. So you, you, we can't take people on that, that, that have a history of, of, of wrongdoing that's serious enough to put a question mark credibility. So if there's no baggage to dig up, uh, then it will have to be fabricated. And we've had a couple of, I've seen a couple of fabricated tweets and messages out there that were supposedly by, by me, but they weren't, they were, were made up, which tried to undermine us. Uh, but we very quickly, you know, just exposed that that's nonsense. <clears throat> um, so I guess you can't beat the truth. Uh, and so when we take on our staff, you know, we ask them the rigorous questions. Is there anything we need to worry about? Uh, look at their past, look at their social media um, history. And, and, and we do our, our thorough vetting uh, and we build a team, a team of credible professionals that that can't uh, be used to undermine the organization. That's that's very, very important. And then. And the rest flows, you know, you, as I said, you can't uh, beat the truth. And yeah, the, the authorities, the ones that we go after, the ones that we want to expose, those people who've hijacked NSFAS, the number of the seaters, Bladens and Mondays network out there, Gwede Mantashi's agendas, and there are a number of these, uh, these entities um, in the many different government departments, transporters fraught with a number of these little empire building entities and the modus operandi of corruption of channeling money out of the state coffers into into networks is, is very similar uh and we just uh, we work with whistleblowers we protect them we make sure that they understand what they're getting into and, and be remain as uh, as anonymous as possible uh and how to protect themselves in feeding information to us but we rely on information. When we have facts, hard evidence of the wrongdoing, that's when we go for it. And we have to do this without fear. You cannot have fear in this game. And I think that's the organization's bigger than one person. So I don't feel threatened. We've never been actually threatened. But we also have to remain vigilant and we have to uh, be careful. So we've got good IT structures uh, maintaining our data security. And yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing team, I must say. But if the government, uh, the only people in government that need to fear us are the, are the, are the ones who are deliberately maladministering our money or corruptly allowing it to be siphoned off. They need to fear us. Wayne, when I did my bit of research before this discussion, I picked up that you actually grew up in Zimbabwe. I never never knew that. I don't know how many people actually know that. But um, I want to understand um, when you transitioned into South Africa, firstly, and then secondly, as a more pertinent question, maybe towards what you're doing for a living now, do you think that South Africa is on that verge or at some stage to, to become like Zimbabwe has become, is it part of your motivate, motivation to prevent that? Because you've seen that firsthand, <laughs> obviously you weren't in the country anymore, but you've, you, you're part of that history. And, and we, none of us want South Africa to, to go that way. Yeah, look, I, 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 and that's not really the driving force. I mean, I was small, I was a child, I think I was five years old when, when my parents decided okay. to relocate to, to South Africa. So I, I have very little recollection of my time there. I'm a South African through and through, naturalized citizen. Yeah. My passion, my roots, I, I'm, I'm South African through and through. I've grown up here, gone to school here, lived here, paid taxes here. My... And I guess whether the Zimbabwe was successful or not is not the issue. The real issue here is, is uh, we have a, a country that has gone through a tumultuous past uh, through the apartheid era. We had a, a really miraculous transition to a, a, a healthy democracy 
and a Madiba and a Mbeki. And we were on the path to be, I think, one of the greatest uh, nations uh, with all our diversity, with all our, our, our natural resources, um, with our tourism potential, our minerals. You know, I, I don't think any country in the world, think about the potential that we had, could touch us. We had everything going for us. Um, why should we be uh, held back as a nation and as a people? Why should we be languishing in such inequality and poverty uh, when we have everything going for us? And that all comes down to leadership. It all comes down to the politics uh, of the day. And we saw that, uh, uh, you know, under Jacob Zuma, our country was literally hijacked. And, and we fought hard to remove him. Ramaphosa hasn't uh, come out fighting, but he's probably the best of, of, of the number of options that are out there. So we are in a good position now to, to, to move forward. Uh, we, I think we've dodged a massive bullet uh, in, that, uh, in, in, in those uh, elections where Ramaphosa sneaked in. Uh, obviously, deals were done with uh, people like um, <clears throat> Mabuza. And it doesn't uh, exonerate him of, 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 of all the stuff that, that, that we know he's been involved in. But as a country, as where we are positioned, uh, and this government of national unity, where we are now, we're coming off a low base. We should be well above where we are. But we can fix this. And the, the potential, so long as the potential is there and we know we can do it, then we have to get there. We can't, we can't go south uh, and we can't run away. We need to work harder as civil society, as business, as responsible citizens to hold our authorities to account. And you can see the political landscape. You can see the people are connected. You know, this notion of this divide and conquer, that's what politicians like to think, like to make us think that we are not united. I can tell you the research shows we are united far more as a people than the politicians want us to say, think and believe. And you see that when the Springboks go out there and the country gets behind them. Sport is an amazing unifier. And it, it tells you the temperature of how united we are. So we've got to move there and we are shifting there. Now we don't have a dominant government. government. And the change, the political dynamics are changing in local government. It's far too late for some of our towns that have collapsed. Uh, but not too late for many of the others, not too late for the countries. I'm excited about our future. I really am. If, we, if I didn't think we had any chance, I don't think I would be, and I don't think a lot of people would be. I listened to a conversation over the radio, um, and Brickus Duplessis won that fight, and now the mayor of Cape Town wants the, the <laughs> next fight to be in Cape Town. And, and the Pretoria guys want it on, on the Pretoria side. And then they phoned, the radio phoned the mayor of Cape Town, Mr. Lewis, and he, they asked him about it. And he says, no, it's coming to Cape Town. I already phoned the Minister of Sport. Now, the Minister of Sport is obviously from another political party. And I remember with the election times, uh, before in the campaigns, those two parties were at it in the Western Cape. They were, mm -hmm. they were sledging each other and going wild. Yeah. And now they're on speed dial on a Sunday morning trying to arrange a sporting event in, in a Amazing. town. And it shows yeah. you the sentiment that has changed. And, and now yeah. they actually realize that we can work together for the greater good here, even yeah. though we might have our differences. Um, Exactly. I want to I want to stay on the positive side here, uh, Wayne. What is what are some of the big projects that you guys are busy with? We know about eTolls. What are the other things um, that that you consider as the major things you guys are busy with? Yeah. Look, I mean, there's 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 quite a lot. Um, you know, of the three hundred projects we've undertaken, some of them are very quick and. Uh, and, 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 and can take a couple of weeks. Others take years. So it's a, it's a, it's a mix. At any one time, there's about 30 or 40 projects that are open. Uh, so we are challenging Sanral's concessionaires, for instance, on the long-distance tolling, not because we don't believe in public-private partnerships, but we, because we believe in transparency, we want to know what is the profiteering that might or could be made by concessionaires. Um, and the minute you ask for information that you're entitled to and they don't want to give it to you, you smell a rat. So uh, we're, we're a long way down the road in those. We have to go to court very often to get information. Uh, we on car power ships trying to keep those gas power plants out. Now imagine if we didn't do that because we took it to court uh, over nearly two years ago. And if we hadn't done that uh, with another civil society organization, 
Um, you might, we might have had three ships in three different harbors right now trying to generate 1,200 megawatts of electricity, which we didn't need. We didn't need it. Imagine now we were forced to pay for that and we have no load yeah. shedding anymore. And they were trying to slip that in under, under an emergency. Uh, so that's a big project which is ongoing. Uh, Nesfas, I don't have to tell you, we've exposed and got rid of the chairperson and the CEO of Nesfas as a result of working with whistleblowers and the billions or the millions that are being made uh, and, and, and siphoned off. The South African Maritime Security Authority, we've got a, a, a project going there on corruption <clears throat> that has uh, been unfolding for some time. The CETAs, also in higher education. I can tell you the sectoral education training authorities, the long and short of it, the skills development levies that all our businesses pay as a 1% of payroll ticking that tax box. That money goes into a cesspool in many of these seaters of connected cronies who are spending millions of themselves. So, so there's that uh, issue and a lot of the uh, higher education, the universities, there's this stuff there. We've got a very exciting project on parliamentary oversight where it's been, that's a specifically funded project by the European Union, where we're working with the, NP, uh, the, the uh, parliamentary monitoring group, PMG, two other uh, organizations, and the other one is Open Up to develop a dashboard of, of Parliament's performance, so attendance by politicians to committee meetings, decisions make, made, tracking of bills, why they're taking so long to get passed. It's a really exciting project. It's called uh, Parlimeter. Um, it should be ready for launch by the end of the year. It's a two and a half year project. We're seven months into it. Really exciting. And working with Parliament and uh, various uh, other stakeholders to make sure we get this right. So, and that then brings that brings transparency to Parliament's performance to the public. Uh, it's such that's that really is. You know, we've always said transparency is the enemy of corruption. The more we can hold people's feet to the fire, it comes through transparency. And our Parliament has failed us over over a number of uh, three three uh, administrations now. So that's another exciting one. There's quite a lot. Uh, the driver's license issues, the card account that was extended to, we said 10 years, it should be there to eight years that come back. They're just really misinforming the public as to why they're changing their minds. The Minister of, of Transport under the last administration, Chikunga and Fikil and Balula, were just out of their depth. There's a big issue on the uh, air traffic navigation services, dropping the ball. I could go on. There's quite a lot. It's very exciting stuff. You are in all the different departments within government at the moment. Um, I've got. Uh, I want to understand also the water can uh, project or division. Mm. I, I see quite a bit of it on LinkedIn and in in media. Uh, what is yeah. it about? How does it work? How do we get involved in that? Yeah, so, so, so what we also decided as part of our strategy, while we are fighting as the main elephant is the accountability division, which challenges government maladministration and corruption and, and inefficient policies. And we, we also decided, do how do we introduce some solution-based thinking and, 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 and projects? And, uh, and, and Water Can is one of them. Joburg Can is another. So the Can stands for Community Action Network and uh, Water Community Action Network. Is, is about, you know, government for a long time wasn't doing the work that they're supposed to do in, in, in monitoring the quality of our water, our rivers and our, our reservoirs, uh, drinking water through the blue drop and green drop reports. And you know what happens in government? People are in today, they're gone tomorrow, they keep dropping these balls. So we, we thought, you know, how do we as citizens start taking over some of these roles so we don't rely on government on, on understanding what the quality of our water is? And that's really how Water Can started. We brought Dr. Farrell Adams on, who was, uh, you know, who's in our, on our in a non-executive uh, a director uh, as a board member in the past. She's a specialist in this space. And we started to... Um, uh, set up a, what we call a citizen science network of, 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 of people across the country that we will provide them with the testing kits. They are downscale testing kits, but they highlight where there are issues. And if need be, we go and get the proper uh, fully fledged uh, laboratory testing of water done. Uh, but it, essentially those, those what we call water activists, water champions out there do this testing, upload it onto our water heat map, our quality heat map. And we can start getting a picture of what's our water quality like. And the number of those have led to 
you know, notices that we've had to tell the municipality, you better send out notices to the public in these small towns to boil the water. It's not safe to drink. Uh, and uh, and it's led to action that is being taken. Uh, we also, you know, working with the authorities, getting water forums going, and just educating the public in general as to what their role is on, on this next big challenge that this country is facing, which is water quality and water scarcity. It's, it's going to make the electricity issue uh, look like child's play if we don't sort it out. We had a good minister. Unfortunately, he's gone to police, or maybe fortunately, because I hope he can work his magic there and sends him to uh, But we're working with the authorities, and uh, that is one department that is working with civil society too. So it's a good thing that's coming out of our water can initiative. Yeah, we can live without electricity. You can still make a plan, but to live without water is unfortunately impossible. Yeah. And um, the quality of water in South Africa is, is unfortunately not there. So definitely a project that one should uh, support. Yeah. I want to um, ask a question on Harry Smith specifically, and only because you mentioned it in another talk that I listened to. Just, just in terms of how you assist local authorities almost and how you work with the ratepayers in those areas to, to almost take back their towns, if I can say it like that. So, mm. so how do those type of projects work um, with these communities where they reach out to you? Yeah, it's, it's amazing how the initiatives that, that civil society just takes up. Uh, Harry Smith, without our help or input, uh, places like Makanda as well, uh, have, have used the rule of law and used their rights and we're sharing these stories and we've started this community action network to help resident associations understand uh, how they start using their rights and powers to challenge local government. And if the more we do this, the more we see uh, the, 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 the powers that they take up. Uh, so Harry Smith, we, we've learned from uh, and shown other areas. You can, you can have a, a, a council disbanded. You can uh, start holding them to account by uh, forcing them to do the work that they've paid for, and if they don't, to follow a legal process, to get the quotes, do the repairs yourself, and then go and pass those costs on to local authorities, such as fixing potholes, wastewater treatment plants, uh, sewage that flows down the streets. And if they don't pay for it, well, then you can get a court order and go and attach their assets. And in Arismith, they were attaching assets, uh, the mayor's car, desks, computers, to the extent that the uh, the authorities now are helpless they can do nothing and then the transfer of power to the people and organize civil society to set up structures and channel through the court's orders channel the funds that ratepayers are paying to a separate special purpose vehicle in from which the citizens now have control over the bank accounts and start fixing the town i mean it's, those are beautiful stories they've done it in sunny's off they've done it to a large extent in in in, in makanda in dramstown where the it is the business chamber that set up an entity that does all the pothole repairs now, and the municipality pays them for that. These are exciting stories. Uh, sadly, you know, you shouldn't have to do this, but sadly in a country where uh, the authorities at local government are running rough over stealing uh, from taxpayers and their ratepayers, you have to. You have to defend your towns. This is where you've invested your money, your houses, your businesses. This is where we create jobs. This is where we live our lives. And if the authorities are not going to look after the welfare of those environments, we have to do this work. And so there's a lot more to be done. Um, sadly, places like Dichibotla, which has lost Clover, Clover just got fed up and, and moved a big employer in the town. That's what happens. Towns die very fast as a result. Unemployment goes up. We can't allow that to happen. So we must fight back as citizens and we must, and we're challenging the city of Joburg. The, the economic hub of this country is, is in decay. And the politicians have hijacked the city of Joburg and they are still there. And they are running roughshod over the due process on Joburg Roads Agency, water, electricity, all these different companies that the municipality has set up, they outsource a lot of the functions that they should be doing themselves to connected cronies, to, to have board members that are not fit for purpose, CEOs, uh, the Joburg Property Company, that are just, it's madness as to what our politicians are allowing to happen under our noses. We have to fight and get our city back. Otherwise, 
We're going to see more immigration, and we're going to see stranded assets in this economic hub, and we're going to see the collapse of an amazing city, and we cannot allow that to happen. Yeah, I do agree with that. Um, I think I know the answer to the next question. I want to hear what is your opinion on what people call a tax revolt, withholding taxes, and all, almost like you said, the rate payers now channeling it through a special purpose vehicle, that scenario. What is your opinion on that? So there's two areas. I think, uh, uh, firstly, at a national level, a tax revolt's almost impossible, and it's and even if you were able to convince business, because business pays over PAYE, VAT, all of the amounts to, to national treasury, they're not going to participate in a tax revolt. The laws favor government. And, and, and quite frankly, even if you could, just say you could convince business to go on a tax revolt, you don't want to live in a country where that takes place. You don't want to live in a country where the police don't get their salaries, where teachers and doctors don't get paid, the ports come to a grinding. It's chaos. It's anarchy. Yeah. Uh, but at a local government level, you can get this right. Uh, and, and that's where you use the rule of law. Two classic examples. Last year, Westville Ratepayers Association went on a, a, a tax revolt. They uh, got convinced enough people to stop paying their taxes. And it was ruled unlawful. And, uh, and they got a bit of a hiding. Uh, whereas a similar process was uh, unfolded in Mangaung where a organized community was not getting the services that it uh, needed and was paying for from, from the municipality. They went to court, got a court order, and, uh, and, and, and were allowed to divert taxes towards their own solutions for waste removal. And we've seen that in Costa and in Sanizov, where if you use the rule of law and you get a court order to divert revenues and the citizens get involved in the fixing, it changes things. So it's those type of localized but legally uh, sought after tax revolts that are very, very successful. And that's the route one must follow at a national level. I think we're moving in the right direction as a country, but a tax revolt there is, is firstly not possible and secondly not what you want. Yeah, I do agree. I think the, the safety aspect is probably the most crucial one and then obviously the longer-term effect of not having – education for, mm. for, for our kids in, in those areas. Wayne, I want to thank you for your time. I, before we close off, I just want to ask on a personal level, our podcast is called The Right Place, and it talks about um, networking and connecting and, and adding value to the community that you are in. Um, do you believe that you as Wayne are currently in the right place? You know, uh, it's an interesting question because this was never a career path that one, I don't think anybody thinks about. I certainly didn't. It gravitated to that. Uh, I've been in the right place, absolutely. I love what I do. I, I find I'm adding value, I think, I hope I am. But at the same time, you know, uh, one never can say, well, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Holds the future for me, but right now, I'm enjoying what I'm doing and the networks that we are, are forging in this new space that's unfolding and with business now coming on board to realize they have a role to play in defending democracy and supporting organizations like ourselves. Uh, that, that, that also excites me. So our strategy changes as we go along. But this is, uh, you know, there's no equity in, 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 in civil activism. This is a nonprofit organization. And, uh, you know, I've, I, I'm not going to work for the rest of my life, but, uh, but I'm, I'm still going to be working for a number of years going forward. I, I'm really enjoying my, so I'm in the right place, absolutely. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear that. And long may it continue to, to end off with maybe just where can people get hold of Alta? Um, how do we get involved in it? How do we contribute maybe financially or in terms of services and so on? Yeah, thanks for that, because it's a very important question. I think people, a lot of people love what we do, but they don't know that uh, we rely on uh, on the funding from public. So, so uh, you know, we are a crowdfunded organization. Thousands of people giving us an average of 150 rand a month. That's the price of a pizza these days um, through a debit order process, so we don't have to chase debt all the time. It's, it's a lot easier. It takes five minutes to sign up. And they get our newsletters. They feel active as citizens because they're contributing to an organization uh, that is uh, that I believe is doing good for the country. Uh, so, so it's very quick and easy if they go to outer.co.za 
uh, there's a support here button, click, uh, it takes five minutes to sign up and be, be an active citizen. And it is about active citizenry. Yes, we're all busy. We're all running around, looking after our own lives, doing our own businesses. But somewhere out there are thousands of organizations that are doing good for you, for your area, for your civil society, your resident association, and organizations like ATA. And we just need these injections all the time. And I guess I want to finish with this message. Never think that the um, small amount that you uh, could give is not going to make a difference. Because if everybody thought that way, we wouldn't exist. Uh, so, so so, don't think that. Uh, you know, Just know that we need your 150 rand a month. We want people to come on board and support us uh, and be the active citizen that, that, that you can be. Uh, very good. Thanks for that, Wayne. I think the, the message from my side would be that it's almost better to give that 150 a month than to give a thousand or 2000 rand periodically yeah. because of the sustainability of what you guys can do with a consistent cash flow exactly. rather than heaps of cash every now and then. Our model is we employ and pay, try and pay market related salaries and employ professionals and we can't pay them once a year or once off. We got to pay salaries <laughs> monthly. I pay our rent. Yeah. We like any company. We've got data costs. We've got system costs. It's it's it costs a few million rand a month just to run this organization. Wow, yeah, good. Um, yeah, we'll spread the word as well. Wayne, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you taking the hour or so out of your day chatting to us. I hope uh, it makes a small difference in people's lives that listen, but also in the income generation for you and the publicity that Alta might get out of it. And yeah, we've been following your work for some time, not just Wayne's, but the Alta. Uh, organization. You've, uh, Julius has been a, a guest a speaker at the Clara Business Network in, in Cape Town, where John is, and you've been at Irene. And, and we appreciate that, uh, you buy, guys buy, buying the time out and just um, engaging with the public that you also serve. And, and we, we do see that and we appreciate that. And I think that is potentially what I regard as the success factor here is that you're not removed from the people that you serve, whereas sometimes within government, we feel like they're on this pedestal away from us, mm. even though we've placed them there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks. Uh, thank you again and uh, appreciate your time. And then um, we'll see all of the rest of you again at the right place. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Rudolf, for the opportunity and for, for listening and sharing our story. Thanks very much. All the best.